Mm -hmm. Does the microphone work? Does it work well? All right. No. Does it work well? Okay. No? Higher? Let's see. It's up here? Or... Is it better now? Better? All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'd love to uh, talk about uh, the work we've done uh, with my group on uh, phone assisted optical properties in materials uh, and new uh, implementation on uh, ETW. Uh, so, first of all, a few references for you if you're in the field of optics. I recommend the following uh, books for you. Um, the Oxford Master Series uh, by Mark Fox is a wonderful introduction to the topic of optics in general. Uh, Another one, very interesting for technical aspects is the uh, Bassanian Paravicini book. It's, uh, it has very detailed equations for everything, as long as uh, these three papers are very handy. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Well, I much better. All right. Uh, so, first of all, the motivation. Why should we worry about uh, phone assisted optics? And a very strong motivation is silicon itself. Um, perhaps one of the most important materials in history and definitely the most important semiconductor. Um, if you look at its direct absorption, a direct absorption of, uh, here's the uh, occupy valence band, conduction band, occupy states and empty states. When we send the photon in, uh, electrons uh, absorb the photon and go from the valence to the conduction band. That's a direct absorption and it's well understood. Um, today we have very good spectra. And here's an example from the uh, Berkeley GW code. Uh, the dots you see here are experimental data for the absorption of the silicon, the dielectric function, as a function of photon energy. And um, you see that, that the curves without excitons, that's the GW level. Uh, you get the right peak positions, the peak heights don't come out as correctly. But uh, once you include excitons, you get an excellent agreement for the peak position and the peak heights at the same time. And not only that, uh, also this work by Marini also shows that you can also determine the spectra same spectra as a function of temperature. These are uh, vibrations can broaden the absorption and, and, and tell you how the spectra in ultra, ultraviolet uh, change with temperature as well. So silicon we do understand very well. Um, if you notice though, all these absorption calculations occur in the ultraviolet. And uh, while in the visible spectrum, uh, the absorption you would get from it, uh, if you do a direct calculation, uh, would be zero. And the reason is that uh, the, we know, though, that silicon does absorb visible light. It's not transparent. Uh, its incidence gap is 1.2 electron volts, while the minimum direct gap uh, is 3.4 EV. So you only get direct transitions when the, your photon energy is in the ultraviolet. It's impossible for silicon to absorb in the, in the visible. Uh, to absorb across the indirect gap, you, you also need the assistance of phonons. You need some extra mechanism to provide momentum and conserve the overall energy and momentum in the process. Um, and actually, this kind of mechanism is what enables silicon solar cells to work. Without phonons, silicon will be transparent like glass. Um, so we want to understand this, this, this mechanism in, in materials in general. All right, so when we come back to uh, discuss a little bit about linear optics, just to introduce the coefficients that we're going to calculate today. Um, linear optics uh, primarily deals with uh, refraction and absorption, right? Uh, and Here's an example of Snell's law. The refractive index tells you how uh, light bends when it crosses from one material to the other. And uh, absorption has an example of a laser pointer pointed to a solution. And you see this exponential decay of the intensity of the beam as it uh, gets absorbed in the material. Okay. And the absorption is a function of position. And in this case, the depth in this solution uh, decays exponentially. And the exponent is uh, alpha times the, the position. And alpha is the coefficient we're interested in, the absorption coefficient. Um, it's units, as you see, it multiplies length, so it has to be inverse length, and usually measured in inverse centimeters. And when you talk about a material that's a strong absorber, like a gallium arsenide, solar cell or so, values you get about 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6. Uh, and if you invert that, you get the characteristic length scale over which light absorption happens. So for a direct gap material, um, Typically, one micron is a distance over which you absorb most of the light that, that, that passes through it. Okay, so these are, num these are the coefficients we'll focus on, and these are numbers to keep in mind about what is strong and what is, what is weak. Okay. All right, so um, 
So to generalize, to combine those two, we land them together in what we call the complex refractive index. It has the real and the imaginary part. The real part dictates propagation of light. The imaginary part, imaginary component, uh, dictates the dissipation of light, the absorption. Okay. Uh, you also talk about the complex dielectric function. Uh, again, the real part uh, presents a screening and, and um, uh, propagation, while epsilon 2, the imaginary component, is the absorption that we saw earlier in those plots. The two of them are, of course, connected. Um, in the simplest approximation, uh, one is the square root of the other. But if you want the full equation, it's, it's right here. So uh, n and k depend on epsilon and epsilon 2 through, through these two equations, right? Um, and last, if you want to find the absorption coefficient, again, in, in units of inverse length, it's directly proportional to the kappa, the imaginary part of the refractive index. Okay, so you multiply by omega and c, and then you have this coefficient you can then go and measure experimentally in an optical experiment. Okay. So these are the parameters we'll, we'll focus on in our calculations. Okay. Now, uh, if you go back to the early theories of light absorption in materials, in this case, uh, a metal, uh, you, you look into the semi-classical theory uh, divided by Drude that was even actually older than quantum mechanics. And the way you would do this is you would write down a, um, a Newton equation, um, effective mass times acceleration is equal to uh, here's the electrons in the material, then you apply an electric field, and they feel a, a force by the field. And at the same time, they scatter, right? Every, uh, every so often, you know, with like this time scale tau, those electrons scatter in the material and change their momentum. And you must have seen this problem. If you apply a static electric field, you can derive the conductivity of the material. That relates to mobility calculations we discussed earlier in the school uh, with this parameter tau. Uh, if you also study uh, the same problem under the influence of an alternating field, an AC field, you can also derive an equation for the absorption coefficient. Okay. And again, directly proportional to tau. And the reason is that if those electrons can't scatter, then they would not absorb light. Okay. You can see this because this is a free electron, basically, parabolic band. There is no way to conserve energy and momentum in light absorption in the parabolic band. You must have a phonon to give the overall conservation of energy. Um, and also, once this theory was derived, this tau parameter was phenomenological. Uh, you basically measure a spectrum, uh, say the absorption in a metal, and then you find the tau parameter that makes your equation fit the spectrum. Uh, but today, of course, we can calculate this tau, and that's what we are going to do. We need to calculate, we need to study this scattering of electrons by, by phonons, by defects, by any impurity you might have in your material and be able to predict absorption. Um, to do it right, of course, you have to go back to quantum mechanics. You can't use the theory for a predictive theory. Okay. So uh, the way we study optics is we use perturbation theory. We assume the light perturbation is weak. We work in a regime of linear optics, where the, the field is not too strong to, to damage the material or cause linear effects. We, st we assume that we have an arbit our, our arbitrary state, our starting point, is what comes out of a DFT calculation. Yeah, you also may even correct it to get a GW corrections to your band gaps, but that will be your starting point. You, you have a set of uh, initial uh, non-interacting electrons uh, which occupy the Consham orbitals and their eigenvalues. And then what you do is you act on them with the electron photon Hamiltonian. You assume you're sending an electromagnetic field, so it's characterized by the vector potential A times the momentum operator P. Okay. Um, in some sense, this is the dipole approximation. It's like the electric field coupled to the dipole moments in your material. Uh, but it's easier to work in the momentum uh, space because uh, extended solids don't have a well-defined position operator. Uh, it needs more, more complex math to, uh, to work it out. OK, so how we find the, uh, the optical transitions, the rate for optical transitions as a function of, of time. The, the, so it comes out from the well-known Fermi's Gordon rule. Uh, the probability per unit time that the optical transition will occur from state i to state f, your initial to final state, is 2 pi over h bar, the square of the matrix element of the perturbative Hamiltonian, times the delta function, which ensures that we conserve energy. The initial and the final state uh, must be the same. Okay. Now, what are the initial and final states? Um, can, in the initial state, you can assume that you have an electron in some valence band of a wave vector k. Your final state, now your electron has gone to a different band, the conduction band, and also you have the energy of um, uh, the photon. This is the case, this is the case of emission. 
and this absorption, you have the H bar omega in the initial state. Electron plus photon gives you the uh, excited state electron. Okay. So how then do you connect this microscopic quantum property to a macroscopic uh, measurable uh, quantity? Okay, the absorbed power, the power that your system absorbs per unit time. This is the probability for a transition for, of a given electron from a given initial state to a given final state. Uh, of course, these states have to be, the initial state has to be occupied and the final state has to be empty, uh, according to uh, Fermi statistics. So you need this prefactor. And then you need to sum over all possible initial and final states in your system. And that, this, this part tells you how many electrons go from the valence to the conduction band per unit time. You multiply by h bar omega, the energy of each of the photons getting absorbed, and that's how you get how much power is coming into your system. Okay, so this is how much power is absorbed by your system. Um, of course, this quantity P contains the electron photon Hamiltonian, which then depends on the amplitude of the electric field. So to normalize, we also have to factor in what's the incident power coming in. So here you need to know the refractive nature of the material, the amplitude of the vector potential, and the optical uh, parameters. So once you know the power coming in, the power getting absorbed, you can derive the equation for the absorption coefficient, right? It's, it's simply this ratio, okay? And if we translate this to quantum mechanics, okay, uh, here what we get. We get this prefactor that involves constants, uh, optical terms of the material, like the refractive index, and then here's the quantum mechanics. We have a sum over uh, initial state band, final state band, and the uh, Brillouin zone index K. The parameters that enter are the Fermi occupation factors. Again, we can only go from an occupied to an empty state. If both are occupied, you can, uh, Pauli, uh, uh, from, uh, the Pauli exclusion principle forbids an optical transition. And then you have this property, the uh, optical matrix element between your initial and your final state. Um, but also you need to take into account the polarization of the light you're sending in. For a plane wave polarized light, uh, the lambda is say, along the x or the y or the z direction, so you correspondingly take the x or the y or the z component of the momentum operator. Now you have to multiply by the energy conserving delta function, so your uh, final state has to be the initial plus the photon energy. So this acts like a density of states. Uh, the more states you have, the more probable it is to absorb the photon. Okay, um, and of course, if, um, if you know the absorption coefficient, you can also find the uh, imaginary part of the dielectric function. Uh, again, a similar equation with a different prefactor. Otherwise, the same quantities come in. And once you know the imaginary part, you can switch to the real part and find the um, screening properties of the refractive index through the kramer kronig relation. And if you do that, you'll get this equation. But, uh, so instead of a delta function, now you have these energy denominators. And one thing to note here is that uh, in the imaginary part, because you conserve energy, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, states close to your photon energy. If, 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 your, if, your, if your photon energy doesn't match an energy of a transition, you won't have absorption. But when it comes to, to refraction, uh, this sum can basically go all the way to infinity. Uh, you have to sum over states that are occupied even to high energies. So this sum is not limited to near the bandage. You have to, to do a summation over many empty states. So here we'll focus on absorption. Um, we'll focus on the near, near edge properties. Uh, but you can do this calculation as well. You just have to include a lot more bands than you would do for absorption. Okay. All right. Now, what, how do we put, put phonons in the picture, right? So far, we just talked about a single photon phone your material and look at direct optics. Um, to do photon, phonons, we also need to go to secondary perturbation theory because we now we have two perturbations coming in, okay? Uh, we have the electron-photon interaction, but also the electron-phonon interaction, and we need to consider both of them at the same time. So we have to generalize a uh, fermi golden rule to go to second order. Again, 2 pi over each bar as before, the energy conserving delta function, and now the matrix element, we have to generalize it, okay? We have to take our perturbation to second order. And this perturbation, and, and also divide, uh, so this causes transition from our initial state to some intermediate state, and from intermediate state, the perturbation causes transition to the final state, and we have to sum over all those possible intermediate states to get a total rate, okay? Now, each of these H perturbation Hamiltonians contains the electron-photon part, 
and the electron photon part. So here what you have, you have really four terms, okay? Electron photon two times, or electron photon two times, or the cross terms, where one of them is the photon, another is the phonon, like this one. Um, so if you want to study phonon assisted absorption, uh, we need to keep the cross terms on. The other two terms is either two, two photon absorption or two phonon absorption. Okay, so here's what you get. Uh, either your electron emits the phonon first and then absorbs the photon, or the other way around, first the photon and then the phonon. And because we can't distinguish these two processes, these are microscopically indistinguishable, uh, we need to take into account quantum interference between them as well. So we first sum and then square. Okay. Just like a double sheet experiment, first we need to uh, uh, sum the amplitude and then square the total amplitude combined. Okay. All right. So then how does this translate to equations relating to uh, Konshamagian state and energies? Uh, well, here it is. Again, our absorption coefficient alpha is given in terms of uh, constant prefactors uh, and then a sum over initial and final states. And now notice we go from band i uh, to band j, starting from wave vector k, and we go to wave vector k plus q. And here it is. Here's how we conserve energy, right? Your final state, uh, the electron at j and k plus q, is equal to the initial electron energy plus the photon energy or plus minus the energy of a phonon, because it can be the phonon absorption or phonon emission. And what changed, so this, so this changed with respect to direct absorption. The other thing that changed is also the matrix element, right? Now, our matrix element is not just a momentum operator. We have to generalize it to account also for electron-phonon coupling. And again, because we talk about two ways to start from initial state to go to the final state, we have to account for two possible paths, where path in path the label as S1, the electron absorbs the photon first and then emits the phonon, or emits the pho and path S2, the electron emits the phonon first and then absorbs the light. Okay, so what comes in here is you have the optical magnetic element between the initial state I and band M times electron phonon coupling in the conduction band divided by this energy of the intermediate state. And the energy here is the total energy combined, the energy of electrons plus photons plus phonons. So your initial state, your limited state is here. Your initial is the electron plus the photon that has been absorbed yet. For path S2, you first emit the phonon followed by light absorption at the other, at K plus Q. And now the immediate state involves the uh, absorption and emission of the phonon. Okay, there's also a statistic factor P here, which accounts for the occupation numbers. Again, we must ensure that we go from uh, occupied state to an unoccupied state. You can go between two occupied states, of course, or two empty states. And But what we need to multiply by the phonon occupation numbers, the Bose-Einstein occupations. Um, the upper sign corresponds to phonon emission. So here we have N plus one. So phonon emission is possible even at zero temperature, even if you don't have phonons, you can always emit a phonon. And the minus sign cancels this term, so you just get simply NQ. Uh, so in that case, the absorption of Phonons is proportional to how many phonons you have, okay? And another one more comment about this sum M over intermediate states. So you start from an occupied state, you go to an empty state, what should the M state be? Turns out it should be all states, both occupied and empty. Uh, so an electron can even go down in the valence band and then electron from the capital to the conduction band. Uh, how is this possible? It's possible because this is just a virtual process yeah, this is a, a mathematical process that it's, for convenience we, we draw it this way. In, in fact, in the immediate state does not have to conserve energy and doesn't have to even be uh, occupied or empty. Have a question? Mm -hmm. oh, you say if you have a more than one phone in the process? Is it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh you, you mean oh you mean the, 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 this term, right? Yeah. So the plus minus one over two is um, if it's plus one, it, it is the plus sign. This becomes one, right? If it's the minus sign, it becomes zero. So it's either one or zero. It, it's just a mathematical compact notation. You have two choices, right? Either it's zero for phonon absorption or one for phonon emission. Right? 
And so to make them binary choice, we, we write like this. So this is either one or zero. It's never one half, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And of course, you can generalize this. We have more than one uh, phonon, more than one or photon. You can go to third or, or higher orders of perturbation theory. And you can generalize this, this method. Okay, so basically, but these are the key equations we want to implement to study from assisted <coughs> optics. All right, now I want to emphasize why this sum is challenging, why it's not uh, as routine as, uh, as it's been. There, 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 are, there are few calculations for foreign assisted optics, and here's the reason. If you want to study direct absorption, um, then you have a, a single sum over a K point, right? So. You have to, uh, for each K point, you sum over bands, and then you do a sum over your entire Brillouin zone, right? And that you can do uh, quite easily these days. Um, you can even interpolate them with 1 and 90 in both the energies and the matrix elements and, and do it very efficiently for very fine meshes. When it comes down to index absorption, though, you have to sum both over all possible initial states and all final states. This double K sum is what makes it completely very expensive. So uh, try to approach with a brute force way, just brute force calculating matrix elements is going to be very, very challenging. Now, to give an idea, uh, for a case of silicon, if you're going to use an energy resolution of 30 millev to get a good spectrum, to convert it, you need a grid of 24 by 24 by 24 K points. And that is both for the initial and the final K points. And if you account for all possible combinations, that gives you about 200 million combinations. So even though calculating one of these diagrams is relatively easy, it takes less than an hour for silicon, if you multiply by 200 million, that, that's a lot. Okay, that's why trying to approach in a brute force way is, is basically hopeless. And that's where one interpolation comes in. That, this is really one of the examples where the uh, power of one interpolation uh, evidence itself. So again, here we use maximally localized wave, one year functions to convert to the localized basis. And this way we can, um, I have a localized basis set that doesn't interact uh, in the long range, and we can use it to interpolate uh, energies and optical matrix elements. That's what happens in 1N90. But the power of EPWs can also do the same thing for the electron phonon coupling matrix elements. So let me go back one step again. So the ingredients we need here is we need optical matrix elements, electron phonon matrix elements, uh, phonon frequencies, and electron eigenvalues. Okay, the rest is summing them up. So having it from the two codes allows us to, to implement these equations and in a very efficient, computationally, not, not very demanding way. And one note here is that the current version we implement the code, uh, the optical matrix elements are those of the momentum operator. And I want to make a comment here in that uh, when you have a pseudo potential, the momentum operator uh, is not the right operator to use. We have to use the velocity operator that is independent of your pseudo potential. And we're working on, on changing that. The two of them typically differ by a, a small factor, but we, uh, we will have eventually velocity implemented soon as well. And because the velocity can be in, in, interpolated with the one-year basis as well. All right. Um, let me make a comment also about what you expect to find when you do a calculation for direct versus phone assisted absorption. Uh, and I want to make a note here about experiment. How does experiment know? If you don't explain, how would you know that your material has a direct gap or an indirect gap? And the answer is you do what we call a Tauk plot. Uh, Tauk is the name of the person who invented the method. So if you look at absorption very near the bandage, you will find that the for direct absorption, the absorption coefficient is proportional to uh, photon energy minus the band gap to the one half power. This is basically the density of states, right? And divided by omega. So what experimentalists do is they measure the absorption coefficient multiply by omega, and then take the square of the whole thing. And the answer is you get a, a linear relationship with respect to the photon energy. So if you plot alpha omega square versus h bar omega, you should get a straight line. Okay. And here's an example here. Uh, here's an experiment for tin selenide nanosheets. I, I like this plot because it shows both approaches. So on the one hand, you have the, uh, this point f of r, which is the proxy for the absorption coefficient times uh, h bar omega. You square the whole thing, you get this straight line. So you extend it to, uh, to, to where it crosses the zero of the, the x-axis, and that will be your direct band gap, right? The, where this line intersects the x-axis, that's the direct gap. 
Now, when you have an integer absorption, though, this absorption coefficient is proportional to, again, the photon, the photon energy minus the index gap plus minus a phonon frequency. Uh, and this whole thing now it is square. It's not a square, but a square here because the density of sets are independent and divide by omega. So now, if you combine alpha times omega and raise not to the square, but to the one half power, you will get your straight line again. So here's what happens in these curves. These are the exact same data as before, except now we plot the absorption times h bar omega and take the square root of that. And again, you see these straight line segments uh, extend to zero, allows us to get the index gap. And of course, it has to be smaller than the direct gap in general. Okay. So in this material, there's a, here's a, it's direct gap, and here it's indirect gap. Um, and that's how we can tell them experimentally. Okay. Uh, notice, notice though here that the absorption, in the case of index absorption, has two onsets. You can have the phonon absorption term as well as the phonon emission term. And the two of them uh, will take off at different uh, energies, plus minus the energy of the phonon that dominates the absorption. Okay, and because you have these two separate terms. All right, uh, so after discussing this, I want to show you uh, the calculated results for the absorption onset of silicon. Okay, again, here's the absorption coefficient of silicon is a function of the photon energy, and now we have the indirect band gap. Okay, so again, absorption starts around the value of the indirect band gap around 1.2 electron volts. And notice here, this is a tau plot that I discussed earlier. Uh, we take the absorption coefficient, multiply by the photon energy, and raise to the one half power. So this is why we do this. Um, uh, this combination should give us straight lines. And you see that. Let's go first to, to lower, low temperature. So again, you see a straight line coming from phonon emission, another straight line here coming from phonon absorption. When you're at low temperature, of course, what dominates is the phonon emission, that's why it's much stronger, and phonon absorption is a weak contribution. And the difference is two onsets is the phonon energy involved in the, in the transition. And what happens now when you increase the temperature Phonon emission, you see, remains kind of constant, it's not very sensitive, right? It's proportional to n plus 1, and at low temperature, the plus 1 term dominates. Okay. But the phonon absorption term becomes progressively uh, stronger and stronger with increasing temperature. The reason is that this term is proportional to nq, and the number of phonons increase with temperature uh, approximately linearly for acoustic phonons. So in the limit where, uh, uh, when you go to uh, at zero temperature, you don't have phonon absorption. And in the limit of infinite temperature, both of them are equally important and equal to each other because absorbing a medium phonon at infinite temperature is, is equally probable. So that gives you a, an example of a comparison of theory to experiment uh, as a function of temperature for the spectra. And I also want to make a, a note here that when we do this calculation, um, we, we didn't account for the fact that the band gap depends on temperature. So we have to shift those onsets to match the onset of the spectra. But you see here the scales on the order of uh, 0.1 electron volts. And that's, as we discussed yesterday, this is the characteristic scale of how temperature changes your band gap uh, over this range. OK, so besides this constant shift, uh, the spectra are in very good agreement with uh, what we see in experiments. And they explain the temperature dependence and the, and the frequency dependence. OK, now this calculation you can also do uh, by uh, using simple models, let's say. But you can um, get a constant uh, optical matrix element and a constant electron phonon matrix element. Um, you'll be able to do this even without um, uh, heavy calculations. But where you really need heavy calculations for is when it comes to calculating the absorption spectrum in the visible range. Okay. And now we're talking about phonon, photon energies uh, between the index gap almost to the direct gap. And that covers the entire visible spectrum. And, and here it's really when the power of the one interpolation comes in, because now we have transition from every possible issue to every possible final state, and that this become uh, very hard to account for with simple models. And that's where the power of ab initio emerges. And again, here we see a very good agreement with experiment over uh, many orders of magnitude for all those frequencies. I want to mention again that we had to shift the origin because we don't account for temperature dependence of the band structure. But besides this constant factor, you see that the spectra agree with experiment. And today we have the tools to, to account for this energy shift and, and, and we'll get much more predictive power. All right, um, so this is about silicon. I want to mention another system where uh, phone assist absorption matters, and that is laser diodes, like, like the, uh, the point that I'm showing you. Um, uh, for example, blue-ray lasers, which are actually violet, 
uh, a meter 405 nanometers, uh, based on gallium nitride, we're using for optical storage, for laser projectors. Uh, and today we want to develop a powerful green laser so we can combine a red, a green, and a blue laser to make projectors that can fit in, in one cubic centimeter, say inside your cell phone instead of uh, this bulky object. Um, and uh, one limitation there is a, this kind of absorption. I'll show you why. Uh, so here's a theorist view of an LED or a laser. So we make them, uh, so what we have is we start with a quantum well of the material that we want to emit light, in this case, indium gallium nitride alloys with a band of, say, green or violet, and we sum it between T and N type um, conducts, like gallium nitride. We connect a battery, and the battery takes an electron from the valence band of the P type material and moves it to the conduction band of the N type. Now, those electrons and holes um, uh, fall into the quantum well because it's a low energy state where they combine and emit light. That, so that's what we want to happen in our LED or our laser. Um, so so in, in this actual, actual structure, we have more than one quantum well between the P-type and the N-type layers. So in LED, we want to uh, create those photons, get them out as fast as possible, so we design our structure to get light out easily. But when you make a laser, what you want to do is you want those photons to bounce back and forth many, many times and get amplified, right? What we want to happen is the following. Um, we know about absorption, right? You send photons in a material, and the photons um, uh, dissipate by exciting electrons whole pairs across the band gap or another uh, between two states. And that's the um, uh, weird lamp below we discussed earlier. But here, though, in the quantum worlds, we have lots of uh, excited electron whole pairs. And what you get there is gain. And one photon gets amplified by st stimulating a recombination. And, and, and so this positive quantity, uh, the qu G is a positive number. It tells you how your signal gets amplified as it propagates through the material. In a laser, both of these things happen, both absorption and gain. Of course, gain is what we want. Absorption, we don't want it. So in the quantum wells, you have primarily gain. But what happens is your photons don't live here. They have a distribution over the structure. This is the distribution of the electric field of the optical mode. And so they leak into these doped regions where they may get absorbed. And that's what I want to dis discuss. Uh, I want to discuss the process of free carrier absorption. Okay. Now, this is not across the band gap, right? So here we have a wide band gap semiconductor, like gallium nitride, and the light of the laser is not enough to excite across the gap. What can happen, though, is that here we have lots of free carriers, either free electrons at the bottom of the conduction band or free holes at the top of the valence band. Okay. And in this case, direct absorption is not possible. Um, for holes, for example, there are no states for, uh, for them to be excited to. Uh, for electrons, there is a state, but it's a type of forbidden transition, so it's a very weak absorption. Once you factor in phonons, though, then those free electrons that you have in the conduction band can absorb the light and go to a different state in this intraband process mediated by both a phonon and a photon. And that's possible for every photon energy. So that can be a source of loss if you have a doped semiconductor. So again, we did the calculation for phonon-assisted free carrier absorption. Again, now the, uh, we're focusing on these kind of intraband processes between electrons in the bottom of the band to higher states. And we found the absorption cross-section. Absorption cross-section, why? The absorption coefficient here is proportional to how many carriers you have. And the proportionality constant is this cross-section. Um, this is a weak process. To give an idea how weak it is, if, if you have you know, 10 to 19 carriers, which is actually uh, quite high, it's typical for lasers under operating conditions, your coefficient is an order of magnitude is about 10 inverse centimeters. To translate this into a length, it means that you expect a strong absorption over a length scale of 1 over 10 centimeters, about 1 millimeter. That's the scale you would absorb light at. And contrast this to a direct gap material where it's 10,000 or 105 times a stronger absorption and light is absorbed in a micron. So this course, of course, is weak. And one of the reasons, of course, is that you don't have so many electrons, right? You only have 10 to 19 electrons to absorb light. It turns out, though, because uh, photons in lasers bounce back and forth many, many times, the mean free path becomes hundreds of microns. So it starts to become comparable to the one millimeter we discussed earlier. So this process tends, turns out to be quite important for lasers. And one last comment is that you can absorb light by your free holes and, uh, or free electrons, but you can also absorb light by uh, bound holes or bound electrons, like dopants in a semiconductor. And 
And the important thing about gallium nitride is that it has lots of these non-ionized holes, which are still bound to their acceptors. It's very hard to p-type dope gallium nitride. It, 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 it's done. But actually, that, that was what held the field back for many years. That was the discovery that um, led to the Nobel Prize for blue LEDs, the, actually the ability to p-type dope gallium nitride. So what we found in our calculations is that uh, because you have these holes bound to magnesium, uh, they can cause absorption loss in the p-type uh, contacts of uh, lasers, and that is the reason why you lose a lot of those photons inside the laser. Uh, order of magnitude estimates tell you that in a green laser pointer, uh, you would lose about half the light in this absorption instead of getting it out of your, of your laser. So it's a significant source of loss. And, and it's more important as you go to longer wavelengths, and, and that's one of the reasons that um, um, it, it's still challenging to make powerful green lasers with direct emission. Yeah. A green la most green laser pointers today use a frequency doubling of the infrared laser to, uh, to give you green light. Um, but the work is being done to still to, to make direct laser can be as efficient as red or violet ones. Okay, another thing where light absorption can, uh, another case of uh, phone assist absorption is transparent conductors. Again, this is another case of absorption by free carriers. So a conducting, a transparent, you want to make a transparent conductor when you make, you want to make an electrical device like a solar cell, an LED or a, or a, or a cell phone display. Um, that conducts electricity, but is transparent to light. So if you want to use a smartphone, you can, you can touch the screen and send commands to your system while you've still been able to, to, to see your screen. It's because it's coated by a transparent contact like indium tin oxide or tin oxide or zinc oxide. So what's special with these materials? Um, they have wide band gaps. Uh, the band gap is at least equal to the UV energy of 3.4 electron volts, uh, but they're doped. Uh, they're, they're, they're heavily doped uh, oxides, so free electrons in the conduction band are those what give you conductivity. So uh, if you look at the band diagram, of course, it's impossible to absorb visible light across the band gap because the band gap is too wide. There's no space for the electrons to go to. Uh, and if you look at direct absorption of these uh, doped carriers, again, most of the time, there's no space to go to. But if you factor in phonons, then light absorption becomes possible. And that's important because it tells us the fundamental transparency limit of these materials. So it tells you how, how transparent can trans a transparent conducting oxide be. Well, here's the answer. If you calculate this, this properly, you will find the ultimate limit. And, and we do this for n type dope tin oxide. And what we got is we got a curve that looks like this. Uh, of course, the crystal is anisotropic, so we have two different absorption spectra for two different directions. And what you see is that surprisingly, this material is most transparent in the visible, which is a very nice coincidence. As you go towards the UV, you get more light absorption, but also as you go to the infrared, um, for, for the, this phone assisted absorption by free carriers becomes exponentially more important as well. So uh, it's a power law as well. This, this is log scale. Uh, so this tells us what the fundamental transparency limits in those uh, devices. So if you want to dope them up to get more conductivity, you have to pay a price that they're going to be stronger absorbers as well. So it may contribute to a loss in, in the device. All right, uh, and going back to silicon, uh, that's, uh, this process, this free carrier absorption process can also occur in silicon, and that may actually matter for solar cells. Because to, to make a solar cell made of silicon, you have to make a PN junction. So before your light actually gets absorbed in the junction itself, it has to pass through a heavily doped P or N type region well, again, you have free carriers, and those free carriers can absorb the light. Uh, and so there's a competition here. Will your photons get absorbed across the band gap and give you current, or will they be absorbed within the conduction band and then eventually become heat? Okay. Um, and so, so what happens here is you can have actually both processes in silicon. You can have both a direct process between these two bands, or you can have a form assisted process uh, through this intra-band mechanism. Okay. So here are the results. We examine many mechanisms. We examine the direct absorption, uh, phone assisted, impurity assisted, as well as a dissipative behavior. It turns out all of them contribute. Uh, all of them give you some contribution uh, in the visible and in the infrared. And when we sum them all up to compare to experiment in the infrared range, because experiment, uh, you can distinguish, uh, here you have absorption across the gap and masks the experimental data. But in the infrared, we have uh, reliable data. 
we see that our theory is again in very good agreement with the experiment and also explains why this uh, shoulder feature happens. This shoulder is coming basically from the direct peak. At this energy, this energy here corresponds to, uh, to the difference of energy between the two conduction bands and that gives you this uh, slight uh, shoulder behavior as well as the monotonic increase. Um, so overall, we, we trust that um, these methods give very good results com compared to experiment and can explain what happens in a uh, dope silicon solar cell. Right. Um, the other, other groups have also used this method to study metals because in a metal as well, um, again, uh, in a metal, uh, I'm not sure this, this is silver, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what, what the bunch of, which of, of the metals is, is this one, but again, you see that um, Direct absorption becomes possible only from the D band to the S band. And only once you factor in um, uh, phonons, you can have absorption in the infrared and, uh, and longer wavelength. And this kind of absorption mechanism is uh, what gives you the dissipative uh, plasma energy loss in metals, right? Uh, the dissipation rate directly proportional to the imaginary power directive function. And again, there is a strong phone contribution. So you see here similar equations to the one that matter for uh, phone assisted op uh, optics. And, and they do contribute a lot for metals. Because as you can imagine, when you go to long wavelengths, you primarily have the phonons contributing to, to this absorption. So the details come uh, from this manuscript. Uh, and last, of course, I'll emphasize a, a very promising alternative method to calculate phone assisted optics developed by uh, Zacharias and Justino. Uh, and it's a, a very smart method is in, uh, instead of doing second order perturbation theory where your two perturbations are uh, photons and phonons, uh, what I discovered is that you can do a direct calculation and incorporate the phonons into your starting Hamiltonian, into the, the structure itself. So um, they discovered that a single supercell, single open supercell, where you, you multiply the, your unit cell by an integer number and then you displace the atoms according to a specific linear combination of the vibrational modes. So, so your structure now incorporates the electron phonon Hamiltonian. And then, you, uh, so because you incorporate it, you can only need to do a first order perturbation with direct absorption. And again, you get uh, excellent specs that uh, uh, match experiment to, uh, to an amazing degree as well. Um, I, I want to mention some advantages here compared to the second order method is that this method also avoids the divergence that we have in phone assisted optics when you uh, are in the direct gap region. Um, the previous equations have this problem that if your intermediate state becomes real, then the equations diverge. And you have to incorporate somehow the lifetime of those states to avoid it. Um, it also avoids the need for interpolation uh, and also gives you the temperature dependence of the eigenvalues and, and the band gaps as well as this long Urbach tail at, at, at long wavelengths. Uh, another, uh, uh, one other approach that was very appealing uh, to me, at least, is that uh, we have many methods to calculate uh, uh, constant structure and direct optics, but um, can be generalized for other functionals, some for, for some of which, for example, we may not have the uh, density function perturbation theory implemented. Uh, for example, you can do uh, hybrid functionals, you can put Van der Waals functionals, you can do excitons. So it's a very general method, and the details uh, uh, in this very nice technical paper in physical review B. Um, all right, so this is the summary of the, uh, the story so far. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge the funding source, uh, sources as well as the uh, collaborators, both in doing the science and implementing the code. And we'll practice more this afternoon to do some of these calculations yourself. And with that, I'll start questions. And thank you very much. <laughs> all right.